If you have your Bibles, go ahead and open them to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 10 is where we're going to start this evening. I was told there was a lock-in tonight, so I hope y'all don't mind if I preach to midnight. Y'all see the faces on these kids over here. That was, that was funny right there. I don't care who you are. That was funny. I'm really not going to preach till midnight. Cheyenne's still worried. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 10. By the grace God has given me, I laid a foundation as an expert builder. And someone else is building on it. But each one should be careful how he builds. For no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. If any man builds on the foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, his work will be shown for what it is, because the day will bring it to light. It will be refilled with fire, and the fire will test the quality of each man's work. If what he has built survives, he will receive his reward. If it is burned up, he will suffer loss. He himself will be saved, but only as one escaping through the flames. Don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's spirit lives in you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him, for God's temple is sacred and you are that temple. Do not, be, do not deceive yourselves. If any one of you thinks he is wise by the standards of his age, he should become a fool so that he may become wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness in God's sight. As it is written, he catches the wise in their craftiness. Let's pray. Father God, thank you so much for what you have allowed us to be a part of in our worship this morning and as we continue through our day that we have the opportunity to continue and study this evening as we have praised and honored you in song and glorified your name and father as we continue in this service we pray father that we will open our minds to what you would have us to know that we might prevent within us the things that keep us from being who we need to be in you father may we build on the foundation that you have given us May it be something that we can set our eyes to, put our hearts in, and understand who we are. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Preventive maintenance. Check your motor mounts. Now, whenever I was a young teenager, I was already driving before I learned how to change the oil in the vehicle. My dad decided, I told you, I've told some of you this before, but it used to be that whenever my dad realized that it was time to actually change the oil, not just add oil, but change the oil, it was time to get rid of the car. We did that on a number of occasions. I remember driving a 1955 Chevy two-door with a straight six in it on the column of three-speed. Loved that car. If nothing else, I looked like I thought I looked good. It was special. And then the first car that I ever bought was a 1964 and a half Mustang. And I say 64 and a half because in 1964, they came out with 2,000, and I actually had one of the first 2,000 made. I did not know that until I sold it. The young man that bought it from me came over and said, oh, by the way, did you know what you had? I said, no, what do you mean? He said, well, look at this little plaque here on the side, and he gave me the number, and it was 18-something. And I said, Okay. He said, they only built 2,000, and this is 1,800 and something. He said, as far as I know, this is only the 750th or 751st that's, been, that's in existence right now in street running condition. And that was in 1970, and uh, it was 1975 when I, I got that, and I just loved that car. I just didn't know what I had. And sometimes, you know, when you don't know what you have, you don't know how to appreciate it. And so one of the things that I learned was I started learning how to take care of a car during that time. But I moved to Fort Worth, and when I married Lisa, we, we moved to Fort Worth, and, uh, or I moved to Fort Worth, and, and we got married, and, and we bought two vehicles that cost us, if I'm not mistaken, Lisa, you may have to help me here, less than $300 for the boat. Yes, oh yeah, she said. We bought one of them for $150. It was a 1964 Fairlane Galaxy 500, four-door, white, perfect interior, 
did have a little bit of an oil leak because the seals had gotten old and you know how that goes if you have ever done that preventive maintenance could have been kept that from happening but I learned about those things but that's the car that I learned about what a motor mount was because one of them went out and all I know is that whenever I started off it would go boom 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 until we got going down the road and we come to a stop it'd go boom 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 and I was going what is wrong with this car so a buddy of mine said well let me take a look at it he did and he said your motor mounts are going out I said my motor what he said your motor mounts are going out and so he shared with me and we put one on he put one on I learned real quick I had very little capability I could do preventive maintenance and he said if this car would have been taken care of and had preventive maintenance as it went on this never would have happened it just got dry and whenever you started driving it again and it got out of the road you overworked it without getting it greased I said getting it what for those of you who are young and don't know that they used to do that we used to have to grease our cars you don't even know what grease is never mind um, and I'm playing I'm just kidding I love you guys I was dumb too well I was but motor mounts in a car are there to make that engine that would just run all over the place run steady in that vehicle hold it together it was the foundation of that vehicle and that motor and I love the opportunity to be able to share stories like that because it means so much to me to show me how far I've come in some things question how are we doing spiritually we have the foundation and sometimes we have something and we know what it is and we're so thankful we have it but the preventive maintenance that keeps us from losing what we've had is lacking sometimes we don't know how to take care of our spiritual lives I had a lady come to me one time she was six in her 60s she said I've been a member of the church for almost 40 years and she says I'm having trouble and I said what is it and she said I just don't know how to maintain my spiritual life. She's been a member of the church longer than I had been alive at the time. And I got to thinking about how difficult that must be that we deal with that on a regular basis. And believe me, elders will tell you that that's one of the things that we have to deal with on a regular basis are people who have failed to understand the need of preventive maintenance, not knowing where to plug it in or put it. And it, it scares me sometimes. Jesus and his gospel are our motor mounts. It's the foundation upon which we build. The preventive maintenance comes along as we look at that, and it's, it's the thing that affects our spiritual lives once we've accepted that basic message of the gospel. Much like the foundation of a house that Paul talks about here in the First Corinthian letter. As a house sits, it sits on a foundation. That foundation sits upon a a, a, a semi foundation underneath it that helps to keep it level usually they'll use sand or or even bedrock as it's put in and makes the piers in the foundation the foundation has to be firm to keep what is on top of it stable that's why we talk a lot of times about a firm foundation there was even a, a, a brotherhood magazine that had that as a name firm foundation great great articles in there and I loved reading the firm foundation it was great spiritual food and it helped us to have preventive maintenance there are several other brotherhood magazines that did the same thing in, in writings uh, similar to the gospel minutes but everyone who goes through their lives has to understand that we have a foundation upon which we have begun our, our building of our spiritual house in our text, there are other people in the world who have other foundations for their lives other than what God had intended. And they call themselves, or even they are Christians, but they have started their lives and started building off of that foundation on which they should have been building in the first place. That happens. And God still loves them. And they need help, and they need strength. They need preventive maintenance. And sometimes... They need to pull into a quick lube to get the oil changed. They may not know how to do it themselves, but they can find help. And that's something that we need to understand, and we need to be the people that help them with that. Because we see people all the time proclaiming that they're 
their motto is sex, drugs, and rock and roll or their place, their belief in science or in a man's ability to solve its own problems. I read one of my young men in the, one of the youth groups where I was a preacher has just finished a book talking about his relationship with Mother Nature. And Lisa had the first page of the book that was published whenever he made that statement. He opened it up and she got about halfway through with it, I think, and I finally said, that's enough. I've, I, I just, no, I'm sorry. Building on the wrong foundation. The preventive maintenance wasn't there. He lost his faith. And that's the extreme. There are others who still attend worship and still are there all the time and they're a part of the family of God. They, they're active. They do all of these things. And we'll talk about that in just a minute. But, but there's preventive maintenance that goes along with that. And because even when we're active, there's still preventive maintenance that we need to do to make sure that we don't lose who we are. Still others place their trust in their own abilities or other people or they have no foundation at all in their lives. There's some people who just kind of live life, you know, the hippie style, you know. Live free. Just do what you want to. That's what the hippie style was all about besides not taking a bath. A young man came to me one time back in the late 70s and he said, I think I'm going to join the hippie movement, but I'm not going to take a bath. And I said, hey, there's hope. There's hope. And he looked at me like, what are you talking about? I said, well, you see the need for taking a bath. I said, at least you're one step above them. Maybe you'll be on your way back. Still others place their trust in their own abilities or other people, like I said, or they have no foundation, but everyone who's ever built their lives on a foundation other than Christ fails spiritually. Because there is one architect and one designer. And before any building begins, all buildings require a qualified builder so that they are both functional and stable. Do not get me to build anything. You can come to me and ask me what I think about how to do it. I used to be able to tell you, but don't get me to do it. I can't even bend the nail right, my father-in-law said. But Paul tells us that he laid the foundation for the human temple dedicated to God, and I think that that's important that we understand that in this passage. He points out in part that in spiritual development of the Corinthian church, they needed to know what it meant to build on the correct foundation. It was through his guidance that many became Christians and through his instruction that their faith began to grow. Many of us can attribute our spiritual lives to the influences of other people. We talked about that this morning, I think rightly so, and, and at a very valid point. Our faith didn't come overnight. Other people help us in our spiritual development, and I think that's very important for us to understand that we need to listen to other people. However, we have to be careful that we're not listening to people because of who they are, but because of what they're saying in the Scripture. Sometimes we idolize people and we lose sight, and that's part of that preventive maintenance that we have to deal with. I'll never forget, I went to a congregation, was preaching, and one lady came up to me and said, you'll never be a brother so-and-so, and I thought, I hope not. I never intended to be. I want to be like Jesus. I want to be like him. There's a song there somewhere. I want to be like Jesus. I want to be a person that's known for being like Jesus. I don't want to be like Brother So-and-so. I don't want to preach like Brother Kemp. I don't want to preach like other men that I've known through the years. Oh, they're great men. The closest one I ever wanted to be like was Arliss Vandiver whenever I was growing up because he was the last preacher we had. He was good. He kept my attention. And the reason he kept my attention was because I found out later there had been some preventive maintenance to help me do that, as I call it. And we'll talk about that as we go through this study. But our faith doesn't come overnight. Other people helped us to come to that point. Sunday school teachers, preachers, many other godly people help us to mature spiritually through their encouragement, example, and teaching. And Paul recognizes this. And he calls them godly people. And they're needed to help people build their faith up upon the foundation of Jesus and his gospel because these are the architects of faith. These are the people who will help guide you to build correctly. You have to be the builder. You may need help and there may need to be architects that you go to and you ask for, for direction and, and they may even have a great plan for you. It's like going to a 
a dealership and they give you that book that says here's what you need to do and you need to change your oil this often and you know and you need to you need to get your car tires changed this often and you need to rotate them this off there's always those things that will help us to grow but Paul recognized that there needed to be godly people in our lives and there needs to be the building materials that no building can be built without good building materials no foundation can be laid we like to watch the commercials about about oil changes you know everybody's got a different oil and everybody's oil will work long I like this you know I like the opportunity to have choices sometimes sometimes some of those oils will tell you you can go an extra 2,000 miles but you get broke down and you've done that and you go back to the dealership and the dealership said well you didn't do it according to this well this said and you've got a discrepancy so you've got to go back to where the truth lies and where everything's going to be judged by and that's what we do in Christianity we go back to the book we look where God wants us to look at and we're judged by those things that are written there because all of these actions will result in the creation of a beautiful temple for the Holy Spirit that God wants us to have if we're building on the right foundation if we have the right kind of help because a good builder will join the materials together in such a way that the building will both structurally will be both structurally sound and it'll be pleasing to the eye and a soul that dedicates itself to unconditionally serving God will radiate inner beauty. It'll just exude from them. And it can also withstand any temptation that comes its way if it's used correctly. It's interesting that all the good materials I spoke about have a way of complementing each other and, and creating synergies. All of these good things create within us an opportunity to grow even stronger. Look at this building. How many of you would sit in here with just two by sixes in place of these beams? No, none of us. Well, number one, it wouldn't have lasted this long. That would, it would look fine. You could make it look good. But it wouldn't be structurally sound. It wouldn't be safe. And that's what we need to understand as we grow into these positions in our lives that we strive to build these things and do the things that we need to do, but we need to understand that the materials that are there are there for our good. The builder who serves God with respect and humility will raise the most magnificent temple and calls our bodies the temple. A good builder will join those together in such a way that the building will be both structurally sound and pleasing to the eye. A soul that dedicates itself to unconditionally serving God will radiate that inner beauty that it can withstand any temptation. Paul also spoke about temples that were created using inferior materials. We read that. We know what happens to gold and silver and straw. What distinguishes superior materials from inferior materials? inferior materials our conduct our motives our service determination and it'll determine the type of material that we're using it'll show us who we really are I like the way that some folks call it taking that personal inventory I mean, even giving to the church or the poor is considered a good action, one possibly worthy of building our temple with good materials. And in order to evaluate whether the giving passes the gold standard, we need to ask some further questions concerning that idea of motive. What are we giving for? Was the giving to God a, a measly share of our incredible abundance? Or was it a thoughtful, prayerful gesture on our behalf? Are we giving back to the Lord out of guilt or obligation or to satisfy our conscience? Or are we giving to him from our heart? See, those things are preventive maintenance. Those things are things that we need to understand and know so that we can grow in the right way. Are we giving large amounts of money to be seen by others or is our gift a prayerful response to a specific need that we know exists? See, our motive for giving determines the type of material we're using for our spiritual house. And here's another example. Perhaps we serve God by teaching Sunday school. It's the Sunday night crowd. 
most of the teachers are usually here let's talk about that for just a minute perhaps we do try to serve God by doing that I mean how do we approach our religious education program how do you approach that do we faithfully prepare or do we leave everything till the last minute are we prayerful in our preparation or do we just try to get it done did we volunteer to teach because we feel a called as it were to share our spiritual gifts or were we forced into teaching because no one else volunteered in other words our motive the quality of our service and our conduct determines the type of materials that we use now I'm gonna give you a sidebar here just a second okay some of you are sitting here thinking man I wished he would preach this on Sunday morning right those people need to hear that yeah they do but they're not ready and you are so tag you're it isn't that what we say ready or not here I come there it is we have a relationship with God that says I need to teach because if I teach I can be an example and if I'm an example for something good that others will see it and it will help them build on their foundation it will be preventive maintenance and maybe not for us individually but how many of us would like our children to drive home with our grandchildren in the car on bald tires and a downpour you want to do that I don't I remember when Lisa and I were young married, my dad, we'd go down to see my dad. My dad said, hey, come go with me just a minute. And we'd go, he said, get in your car. Let's take your car. I got to run up here to the store, man. And after a few times, I realized what was going on. He took me to the, took me to the gas station. He filled up my, my gas tank. He checked my oil. My dad did a lot of changing over the years. He'd check my oil and make sure everything was all right. And he said, make sure I, and this was his best one. Make sure, whenever they came out with the, uh, you know, the windshield washer fluid, he made sure that was always full whenever we left his house. One time, Lisa and I were driving home, I believe may have been even from church, and she uh, tried to wash her windshield, and we were out of stuff. I said, well, I guess it's time to go to Dad's. But we wouldn't let our children do that, and God doesn't want us to do it either with our family here. When we have opportunity to do good and to teach and to be good examples, somebody said, well, I used to teach, but I retired. I believe Scripture said we don't retire I believe Scripture said we live for God forever now I understand there's certain things we can't do but there are things that we can do that sometimes we fail to do because we don't think anybody cares God does and I think he's a little more important sometimes than what others we need that and then there comes the building inspector the ultimate building inspector God will both evaluate the quality of the materials and the workmanship I mean at the end of the end of our lives the temple of our soul will be tested to see if we can withstand the fire test actually it happens along the way but the way it's explained here you understand what I'm saying we're told that if any of the work remains after it's tested with fire then we will be rewarded we need to each day in joyful service by being diligent, hardworking, and resourceful servants of God. We need to be thoughtful, prayerful, and exemplifying God's love for us and our love for Him. He's going to inspect our building. And then there are the construction workers and the builders, and the workers are needed in every construction project. It may not be that you are a building inspector. That's God. God's going to do that. But then it comes down to here's the construction workers and the builders, and the workers are needed, and, and their, their skill, through their skill, the materials that are used will construct a wonderful building that will not be just two by sixes, but it'll be structurally sound. It'll be something that we can see that it's good. Unfortunately, not all the workers are the same. We live in a world of difference, not a world of sameness. God will only reward those who are wise in their work. 
The better construction workers are to be diligent, to use the best materials. They are skilled in their trade and they will get the job done on time. Paul points out that we are each the builder of our own temple to God and we are to challenged to become the wiser builders, to be the builders even when we've been the workers. That is a process that we saw happen this morning and will continue on in our world. God's going to reward those wise workers. And since God will inspect our temple, we will each want to make sure that it will withstand the fire test and the inspection that God will give us. Shoddy builders come and go. They construct their temple in the gospel foundation, but they do it with faulty materials and they're careless in their work. Gamaliel even made that statement in the first century about Christians. He said, gentlemen, if you want to, you go ahead and kick against, the, against this, but if it, you better be careful. You may be kicking against God. And I know I'm paraphrasing, but you know what I'm saying. He said, the testing is there. And it's of God, you're not going to stop it. And folks, that's where we need to be. Nothing escapes God, and God will burn their temples down. And each temple burned to the foundation indicates a Christian who declares his faith but absolutely does nothing with it. I mean, these are Christians that just maintain the status quo. Their lives are wasted lives because their motives, their conduct, and their service were internally directed at what they could get out of worship and praise and not what they were giving in worship and praise. Because God was not a first in their life. He was just an afterthought. And Paul makes another distinction between workers here. He identifies the wise worker and the shoddy worker, but he also mentions the destructive worker who destroys people's faith. Here's a good builder. This guy's good. Look at what, you know, he's happy. He's, he's got his thumb up. He's ready to go. He's, he must be an Aggie. But, and I'm not an Aggie fan, but that's okay. We'll get along all right. But then there are the other workers, the sloppy workers. He's just ready to relax. I was afraid somebody thought that might be me. But folks, destructive workers are those who will pervert the gospel. They drive people away from the church. They encourage people through their actions and their lives to sin because they cause derision and dis disenchantment within the body of believers. Side note, listen very, very carefully to this. Very carefully because I'm only going to say it tonight until next week or two weeks from now but I want this to be on your minds if you have to tear somebody down and what they're doing no matter what it is whether it's good or bad and you have to do it with somebody else in the room then you're sinning when we have a brother who is hurting and we know that he may be in sin we're told how to take care of that, and that is to go to that person and pray with them and help them. Then you take steps if that's necessary. But you jump on somebody for something that they've done, you've not got the heart of God. You've not got the heart of Jesus. See, they could read hearts. They could determine whether somebody was bad or not, and we have not been given that We've not been given that ability, nor will we ever have it. But over the years, that's been the one thing that has bothered me the most in my ministry, is hearing Christians talking badly about other Christians and the sin in their lives and doing absolutely nothing about it. Folks, that's just as bad as what they did. It's sin, and that's all it is to it. Now, that was free, and I won't bring that up again for a couple of weeks. But they encourage people to sin, and they do that because they're destructive workers, and they cause people to turn away from God and to actively tear into people's lives. And without Christ, people's lives are reduced to rubble. Their temples are torn down. Their building is gone, and their triumphal, radiant temples are abandoned, descript ghost towns. The punishment for the destroyers of God's temple is harsh. And that's why I warn you so <clears throat> urgently 
because they too will be destroyed and God's warning is clear. If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him. Our hope is to focus on serving God with our entire being, to be the kind of people we need to be so that we can help him bring the knowledge of his truth to the entire world without having to worry. Now I want to remind everyone that we build our own temple to God. And since the quality of our workmanship, what we build on that foundation has eternal consequences, I think we must undertake this building project with the most care and respect and do some preventive maintenance. Because the foundation of our building is nothing other than Christ and his gospel of forgiveness and salvation. That's the foundation. That's where it starts. That's the beginning. We're encouraged to find a more mature Christian to help us develop in that faith and lead us to the right path. And, and God bless us, please, with some of those people who are willing to be that person. The construction of our temple should be undertaken with only the best materials using, using quality labor, not haphazard. Because the best building materials of our temple are found when our motivation is to serve God with our entire mind, our entire heart, and our entire soul. And since God is the ultimate inspector, if he's going to be the building inspector, if he's going to be the master mechanic of our lives, and he sees everything and knows when we are shortcutting him or shortchanging him or are working for others when we are on his building project, we must pay attention at all times. Because if we're faithful, if we're diligent and we're obedient workers, our one-story temple that withstands God's fire test will be greater and grander than anything built on any other foundation. Read a poem one time about a lady that said, I just want a little cabin in the corner of heaven and I'll be satisfied. Folks, I want you to know something. Any place in heaven it's going to be so much better than any place outside of it. I don't care what it is. And I can't wait to get there. What can we do this week that will help us put up a fireproof room like God wants us to have? I don't know where you are this evening besides here in this building. I don't know where you are spiritually. I know where I am. And I know where I want to be, and I know that it's a constant thing that I have to deal with. But we're going to sing this song in just a moment as an invitation for you to change your life. Now, that doesn't mean that you have to come forward unless you need to. It may mean that where you're sitting this evening, you may just need to say, God, give me strength. Give me an opportunity to change my life now. Let me start. Thank God we have that opportunity just to say, Father, I messed up and I'm sorry. He loves us enough to help us repair what we may have torn down in the building that we put on his foundation. It may be that we need to do that tonight. I don't know where you are, but you do and God does. And if you're not a child of God and you want to be immersed for the forgiveness of your sins, that's what we're here for. That's the beginning point. That's the, that's the starting place. That's the foundation that we build upon is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And if that's your response tonight, so be it. We'd love to have it. We'd love to help you with that. But know this. God's buildings are worth living for and dying for question is, is are you ready to die that you might live? If you need to come tonight, come while we stand and while we sing.